Welcome to Clot Conversations from Thrombosis Canada. I'm David Airdrie, Executive Director of Thrombosis Canada. I'm Jimmy Abdul Raymond. I'm a hematologist with specialization in thrombosis at the University Health Network in Toronto, Canada. And we're co-hosting the podcast, and we're here to provide you with updates on the diagnosis and management of thrombosis, featuring interviews with authors of recent research publications and highlights of education programs from Thrombosis Canada. We hope that you'll find this program interesting and informative. In this episode, we'll be discussing a recent publication from the British Medical Journal entitled Diagnosis of Deep Vein Thrombosis with D-Dimer Adjusted to Clinical Probability Prospective Diagnostic Management Study and co-authored by a cross-Canada team of thrombosis experts. We're joined today by authors Dr. Samir Parpia, who is an associate professor in the Departments of Oncology and Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. His interest and expertise are in design, conduct, monitoring, statistical analysis, and reporting of randomized clinical trials. As a senior biostatistician, he provides statistical and methodolo methodological leadership for clinical trials and thrombosis. And also author Dr. Kirsten DeWitt, who trained in internal medicine, emergency medicine, and research in the UK. She completed a thrombosis fellowship in Ottawa in 2013. Since then, she has worked in both emergency medicine and thrombosis. She leads a research program which focuses on the diagnosis of bleeding and clotting disorders in the emergency department and is funded by CIHR. Dr. Parpia and Dr. DeWitt, thank you for participating in our podcast today. Thank you for asking us. Pleasure to be here. So let's start by asking if you'd please explain the motivation uh, for undertaking this study. Samir? Sure, but first I would like to mention that the PI and first author of the study was Clive Kieran, who passed away in June of 2020. Clive uh, developed many of the ideas behind this study. Kirsten and I work closely with Clive on the study and are, are very pleased to have got it completed and published. And uh, throughout the study, I worked with Clive. Um, the study was really relevant to me in my practice because it was really aimed at helping emergency physicians reduce the number of ultrasounds that they need to order to rule out deep vein thrombosis. So I thought it was uh, highly relevant to diagnosis of DVT, particularly in the emergency department. Great, thank you. And can you please briefly explain or describe the study design? Yeah, so the study design is a prospective diagnostic cohort design. The study has been used quite a bit in uh, studies of diagnosis of venous, venous thromboembolisms. Um, patients who are enrolled, they follow their diagnostic algorithm of interest and then are followed for 90 days to see whether they had DVT. And the main goal of the study is whether to assess whether the algorithm can safely exclude DVT while reducing the need for ultrasound imaging. Yeah, it, it's a common study um, design, uh, otherwise called sometimes a management study, but most of the diagnostic management studies uh, published in the last decade have been a very, very similar setup. Can you tell us a bit more about the algorithm, the 4D algorithm, and how that's different from the traditional uh, strategy recommended in the ASH guidelines from prior? Sure. Um, so the standard approach to testing for deep vein thrombosis would use the WELL score. And the WELL score has nine items. So a physician evaluates the patient at the bedside, they ask them questions about their past history, and they examine the leg, and then they allocate uh, the WELL score. And the WELL score will divide um, the likelihood that that patient has deep vein thrombosis into either low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And uh, traditionally, we would use D-dimer, definitely in the low risk group and sometimes in the intermediate risk group as well, as a rule out test for deep vein thrombosis. Um, but until now, we've, for deep vein thrombosis, we've generally used the same cutoff for all patients for D-dimer, which is the manufacturer recommended cutoff, which is usually 500 uh, nanograms per mil in FEU, depending on, on the assay. And um, so for this study, uh, what Clive wanted to look at was whether we could increase the threshold to rule out deep vein thrombosis in the low probability patient group. So he actually doubled the threshold to 1,000 nanograms per mil um, and patients who were low probability who had a D-dimer under 1,000 could have deep vein thrombosis excluded with this study protocol. 
So the goal is to use clinical history and blood work to minimize our use of diagnostic imaging. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Because the only way we have to uh, diagnose a deep vein thrombosis is with an ultrasound scan. But ultrasound scan slots are, are finite. <laughs> they only have so many per day. And in the emergency department, you know, people come in all times of the day and night. We frequently don't have access to immediate ultrasound. Often we have to send a patient home to bring them back the next day. And as everyone knows, going to the emergency department is not generally not a, a great experience <laughs> and involves lots of waiting. So anything that we can do to reduce the need for ultrasound mm. is better for patients. Um, it translates to less time spent in the emergency department and fewer trips. And then I understand there was the initial D-dimer testing. And then if patients had an elevated D-dimer, they get the ultrasound done. But if ultrasound was negative, there was also a repeat ultrasound done a week later based on the D-dimer threshold. Is that, is that right? Yeah, so that's right. And I think traditionally, all patients would come back for a repeat ultrasound. But in this diagnostic algorithm, they had to have a markedly high D-dimer for them to come back. So again, reducing the need for the the repeat ultrasound in patients. So we're looking at two, two test points, the initial when they first come in with symptoms, and then if their D-dimer was high enough, they get an ultrasound. And then if D-dimer was very high, they get the repeat ultrasound at one week? That's right. Okay, and then theoretically cut down on ultrasounds at both time points. Correct. Can you share with us what are the what you think are the most important results from the study? Well, for me, the really important result is that we can use the D-dimer threshold of 1,000 in people who score low risk, which means uh, zero, minus one, or minus two points on the well score. That's uh, really important. And we're the first time, first people to have shown that. And we showed that it was safe um, to use that higher threshold in the low risk group. Right. So it's very impressive that the... Uh the rate of DVT in those of patients who did not get anticoagulation was 0.6% during the follow-up, right? Which to me seems very low. Yes, very low, yep. Yeah, so it seems like a really good uh, algorithm. And then also understand this cut down, you looked at the mean number of ultrasounds and did kind of like an indirect comparison to how many ultrasounds would have been done. And it was cut down to 0.72 scans per patient compared to a mean of 1.36 scans per patient. Yeah, so obviously because patients, it's a prospective cohort, we didn't have a direct comparison, but we could assume what um, patients would have if they had the traditional diagnostic algorithm. And what we found was that the number of uh, ultrasound scans would have been reduced by 47%, which is quite dramatic. Yeah, and, and certainly speaking from the point of view of working in the emergency department, it can be really difficult to persuade a patient to come back in a week's time to get that repeat scan. And, you know, if they don't come back, often there's nobody to check to see, it, you know, or to call them to ask them to come back if they've forgotten about it. So um, it's really helpful to reduce the need to make that appointment in the first place. Great findings. So how do you think the changes will ultimately or how do you hope they'll ultimately impact clinical practice? Well, I'd like to think that the uh, findings would be taken up in Canadian emergency departments. Our findings are specifically relevant to Canada because most, if not all, Canadian hospitals perform this proximal leg ultrasound, which means that we can't often rule out deep vein thrombosis on the basis of one ultrasound. In um, some countries in Europe, they will routinely perform a full leg comprehensive ultrasound. So the results may not be as relevant in, in those settings. But in Canada, all of our patients um, have to go through this process with a proximal leg ultrasound, which means that many of them need to have the repeat scan. So um, I would like to think that emergency departments and thrombosis clinics will implement the findings so that we can safely reduce the burden on the ultrasound department and the burden on the patient in that um, they have to wait longer for their scan. They have to wait sometimes hours for the results of the scan. And, and also it means they don't need to return that, that second time a week later. Great. So just some questions about generalizability. With the, um, so specifically in your study, use the Wells criteria for pretest probability. Could a different clinical score be used or do you recommend sticking to Wells if you're going to use the 4D strategy? That's a great question. You know, it, Deep vein thrombosis seems to be different than pulmonary embolism in that we have several scores for pulmonary embolism, 
But for deep vein thrombosis, we only have the well score. So we don't really have a choice of scores. Um, one of the projects that we're working on otherwise, um, as a, a grown as a result partly of this study, is looking at simplifying the well score, but as yet there's no other validated risk stratification score. Um, so the well score is really the only um, clinical probability assessment tool that we have to risk stratify the probability that somebody has deep vein thrombosis. And presumably there was one, if it stratified patients similarly to the Wells one, then the 4D algorithm I think would work just fine there. And then also with the D-dimer, so I understand initially uh, there was a point of care D-dimer assay used, and then later on the study was expanded to just whichever local hospital D-dimer assay was used. So do you think we can extrapolate the findings to any D-dimer assay, or would you recommend just sticking to the ones used in the study? That's a great question. And sometimes people ask me that about the pulmonary embolism diagnostic algorithms as well. Um, there were a range of D-dimer assays used, and to our knowledge, we haven't come across a D-dimer assay that seemed problematic in any way. Um, of course, we didn't include every D-dimer assay that's on the market, but uh, the, the most frequently used assays were included in the study. So we don't see a reason not to use this unless, for example, you're using an assay that doesn't have 500 as the manufacturer recommended cutoff, in which case um, we don't know for sure if simply doubling that threshold, whatever the threshold is for that assay, uh, is safe or not. And then uh, in one of the groups, the moderate pretest probability uh, with the D-dimer cutoff of 500, there was a low number of patients in the, in the subgroup. So the paper comments that unable to fully validate that. So for with the data we have right now, could we still use the 4D algorithm in this moderate pretest probability group, or should we wait until more data is available? I, I suppose the answer is, will we ever have more data? <laughs> there is at least one other diagnostic deep vein thrombosis study going on at the moment, they adjust DVT study. So perhaps they could give us that data, but um, diagnostic deep vein thrombosis management studies are few and far between. I'll let Samir answer what, what he thinks from a statistical viewpoint. Yeah, the, the issue with that was that there were more less patients in that subgroup than we had anticipated at the design stage. And we wanted to rule out, you know, the upper bound of the confidence interval being 2%. But when there's less patients, um, you, you get less precision. Uh, my sense is, is that, you know, if we had more patients, we would have reached that. You know, we have some data from the SELECT trial suggesting that that would have been the case. You know, if one were to combine the SELECT and this, I know they were it's almost a decade apart, but it would, it would um, be below that threshold. And perhaps the adjust DVT study will, will give us more data. But I suspect, but I, obviously you can't know for sure that if we had enough patients in that subgroup or just kept enrolling, we would have we would have met that threshold. But given the data we have now, I think what we said in the paper is right that we, we can't confidently validate it. Perfect. And then uh, just one more question with uh, generalizing. Um, could you comment a bit on using the 4D algorithm uh, versus the age-adjusted D-dimer strategy? Is there some scenarios where you might prefer one strategy over the other, or universally, would you recommend just sticking to 4D? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, from a clinical aspect, usually I suggest to emergency physicians when they're testing for pulmonary embolism, where we have quite an array of choice of diagnostic tests, I usually advise them to use one and stick to it. Um, because if we start cherry picking strategies, then probably we'll be at slightly higher risk of missing cases if we're always trying to push the envelope further to rule out um, PE and more patients um, than we would normally with a conservative strategy. Um, the age adjusted DVT study has, hasn't completed recruitment yet. So we don't have a formally independently validated age-adjusted D-dimer study for deep vein thrombosis. Um, so from that point of view, I, I would recommend using the, the clinical probability adjusted approach um, because that's really the only completed validated approach at this moment in time. I'm going to open it to you guys now. Um, 
any additional thoughts uh, that you'd like to pass on to our listeners? I, I think there are um, some important exclusion criteria for the study. So uh, one big exclusion criteria was that if a patient had had a deep vein thrombosis previously, they weren't included in the study. And that was for a really practical reason, because it can be difficult to tell the difference between acute and chronic deep vein thrombosis on an ultrasound. And so we ran the risk that there might have been a, a false positive finding for deep vein thrombosis. But that means that we have a large patient group who um, we don't have evidence for. Um, and I, I think a lot of patients who've had a deep vein thrombosis in the past become concerned when they have new signs or symptoms of leg swelling or pain. And, you know, so they're not an insignificant uh, number of patients. So it's just to say we don't have data for those patients. And obviously, pregnant patients were excluded as well. Um, and there is an ongoing cohort study, uh, which is a diagnostic management cohort study for pregnant um, pregnant patients, which is still recruiting in Canada. That's the lead study run by Mark Roger. And I think you also excluded patients on anticoagulation. Is that correct? Already on yeah. Anticoagulation. yeah, yeah. And, and that, that's actually, you bring up a really great point. That's a, a real Achilles heel for all management studies in that because the outcome is measured by a lack of a diagnosis for venous thromboembolism in the following 90 days as a sign that that, that ruling out DVT has been done safely, then you, you can't include patients who take anticoagulants because if they're on an anticoagulant, they're very unlikely to go on to develop a DVT or PE in the coming 90 days. Um, so that's another patient group that we don't have evidence for. It doesn't mean to say that this approach wouldn't be just as safe in those patients. But unfortunately, we haven't worked out a way um, to include them in these studies. Anything you'd like to add, Samir? Yeah, one neat thing that I thought this study did was that to help with accru accrual, it sort of consented patients in a retrospective manner, in the sense that patients went through the diagnostic algorithm and then post going through the algorithm, they were consented. And um, the study started with a perspective, just a traditional way of recruiting patients, and it was slow. And once this change was made, in addition to, you know, allowing uh, multiple DDAMA assays, uh, recruitment picked up uh, quite a bit and um, were able to get it completed. So that was another neat methodological change that helped with recruitment for the study. Yeah, and I think that's partly because um, the emergency department runs 24 hours a day <laughs> and it's impossible to have a research assistant at hand for 24 hours a day. I'd like to thank both of you for participating today. Uh, it's been a great discussion and, and thank you for joining us for our inaugural uh, podcast. Thanks, and I'm sure Clive would be uh, very happy that you're doing it. <laughs> Thank you both again. Um, look forward to working with you again on future ones. Thank you for listening to Clot Conversations from Thrombosis Canada. We welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions on the podcast. If you have any recommendations for future podcasts, please send them to us at info at thrombosiscanada.ca. Please subscribe so that you're notified about the release of new episodes. And don't forget to check out our website for education programs, clinical tools, and guides. Please consider donating to Thrombosis Canada to support our ongoing efforts to reduce morbidity and mortality due to thrombosis. Thank you and good day. Good day.